Hello. What does it take to become a better problem solver in an increasingly more complex business world? Why is it important for the challenges we face today as well as for the opportunities we'll come across in the future? How do we fight the urge to jump in quickly to face a problem when we should, in fact, be stepping back and taking the time to solve it creatively? And how could that phone in your pocket help you do it? From a noisy conference room in the AICPA and SEMA head office in London, I'm Kyle Hannon, and this is the Go Beyond Disruption podcast. This week, we're talking to Cheryl Mobley, the CEO of Recalibrate. Cheryl works with companies to support sustainable growth, and we're going to talk about simplifying complex problems, and this is part of our human intelligence work here at the ARCPA and SEMA. You can find more content by visiting our website at beyonddisruption.com and searching for human intelligence, or you can follow the links in our show notes. If you've not heard of Cheryl Mobley before, let's get you up to speed. She's based in Texas. She has a 20-year track record of helping executives solve problems, get results, and grow the bottom line. Cheryl launched Recalibrate a couple of years ago after a career as a successful serial entrepreneur, and she served as president for a highly successful hospital in the U.S. She's worked around the world, and a few of her clients include Allied Irish Bank, the Reed McClear Law Firm, Trans Global Services, Actors Spine and Sport, the Washington State Department of Transportation, as well as uh, one of the largest brokerage firms in the world, the California-based Charles Schwab Corporation. She's also presented to many groups and organizations around the world. She's been featured in publications, including uh, here at the ARCPA and SEMA. She's been featured in the News Tribune, the WAC, the Washington Journal, Women on the Move, and the Greater Seattle Area Chamber of Commerce, to name a few. And now she's with us on this podcast. So, Cheryl, thank you so much for talking to us today. Where are you joining us from? I am actually calling from a rather chilly Dallas-Fort Worth area. Well, here in London, I'm doing what many people are doing as well and fighting off a cold, which is a problem I don't think creativity can help with. I think what I need is something hot in a cup. So excuse me if I do sound a little um, too close to a sneeze every now and then. But it's a common story as we get into January. Yeah. Uh, we're doing that at the beginning of 2020. So here in London, the Northern Hemisphere, it is usually much colder, but strangely mild at the moment. Maybe it is climate change, huh? uh, which does remind me the Davos Climate Conference is on in Europe at the moment. And according to radio reports there, it is apparently much colder than it is here in London. I'm going to be in New York City for an event in about a week. I'm hoping that I've got a little brief period of dry. <laughs> it would be quite pleasant. Yeah, so bring your boots. And an umbrella, I think, is also a good option, especially here in the UK. I consider myself warm. So those are some easy problems to solve with the right gear. But as life and our jobs become more complex, the problems we're going to solve become more complex as well. Now, I have to say I'm not a parent, but I do have friends who are, and they often talk about parenting little kids, and it does definitely bring them great joy. But at the same time, I can see it takes a lot of work, and little kids mean little problems. Big kids mean big problems. And as we become a bigger, more global society now, it means as a bigger global society, we've got bigger global problems. Uh, talking of that, I was just mentioning the Davos Forum, but there's another global forum we need to look at, and that is the WEF, the World Economic Forum. They've identified complex problem solving as a key skill for the future workplace. And the future workplace we're talking about is right around the corner. In fact, it's probably here already. We're already into 2020. And this is definitely a skill we need to be working on to enhance and to develop. Cheryl, you presented at the AICPA and SEMA's Engage conference a couple of years ago. I think that was June 2018. That's when we launched this podcast. And at the conference, you shared your insights on complex problem solving. So let's start with the big question. How do we get better at it? Well, I wish I had magic fairy dust, right? Then I'd be incredibly popular. And so a lot of it is really around as overused as this word may be is your mindset. And it's how you approach it. So if you have the luxury of being alive, then you will have problems. And how you feel about them is going to really determine how successfully you manage them, move through them, kind of bend them to your will, benefit from them. I know when, when we were first talking about doing this presentation at AICPA and, and y'all had pulled together this information from the World Economic Forum and you talked just now about complex problem solving being something that's you know, required. It, it was really intriguing when I looked at the top 10. To me, 
five of the others are really supportive of that. So critical thinking. If you don't think critically, if you don't really question your assumptions, you're not going to be able to solve your problems well because the place that you're starting from isn't going to serve you. Another one was creativity, which for me is a huge point of passion. How do we use creativity to cause us to be more curious, right? And to cause us to be more innovative in our solutions. Another thing they said was really important is emotional intelligence. Also really huge in terms of how you examine the world around you and how you move in it. Judgment and decision-making, that's certainly a vital sub-piece of how you solve your problems. And then cognitive flexibility was the last. And I found it really intriguing that out of 10, really six are really all around how do you think about what you do and how does it either serve you or get in your way? And so for me, it's having an approach. It's realizing how important those things are. And one of the things that we shared was kind of four core practices that I pulled together in kind of my own problem-solving model. And we can certainly talk about that. But just as kind of a real quick highlight, I thought it was interesting because we had had the luxury of being able to do some, allow people to vote. And so the way we started that conversation um, was really what's the context in which a lot of your listeners are dealing with their own problems, right? Because all of us are different. And certainly in the, you know, in the accounting and finance field, you have certain challenges that you have to work with. And that's just your framework. You know, it is what it is. And so the top three things that your folks had challenges with, 42% of them said people and performance issues were a major, a, a major big deal for them. 35% was lack of true staff ownership which is a subset of your people. It's not necessarily a performance issue, but if your people aren't engaged in trying to help you solve your problem, this world, to your point earlier, is way too complex. A single person isn't usually going to come up with an ideal solution anymore. There's just too many moving parts and too many different perspectives. And then 23% said challenges setting and implementing strategy. And again, that last one comes back to me of really being able to say what's important to us. What are we trying to move forward with? Because you can't set strategy if you don't really know where you're trying to end up. And one of the things we talked a lot about that I know we, we had a lot of questions when we were in that session together was really about what's noise, right, for you and how do you say no? A lot of your folks really struggled with how do I say no? You know, not feeling good about it. And so that that was a really big part of kind of our conversation and the questions that came up after. Okay, so I have to ask you, what is the secret sauce? What can you tell us about your approach to problem solving? So my approach to problem solving is for some people, it feels like kind of slowing down to speed up. And so one of the first things that I do is I really look at my assumptions because we all have them which is fine. We have to. If you come up to me in the hallway and say, hi, Cheryl, I shouldn't have a meltdown trying to figure out what you meant. I should just say hi back. When we get into things more complex, though, the problem becomes we don't realize how many assumptions we're running with. All right. And so if you, if you take the time to just stop, take a pause, take a breath and go, what kind of assumptions am I making? What do I really know to be true? Not what I think about what might be driving it, but what do I really know to be true? And honestly, that's usually only about 15 or 20% at the most of what you've been running with mentally, you know to be true. The rest you filled in stories, you've made assumptions about what it means, what other people meant. So really the first thing kind of for the model that I follow is really examine your assumptions. Because as soon as you start moving from a place of assumptions, anything you come up with is not going to be useful, right? So that's the first piece. The second step um, kind of in the problem solving model I use is really identify the outcome you want. About 20% said they really struggled there. So if you don't know what success looks like, again, you're, you're, you're bumping up against a wall that's going to make things even harder. If you don't know what you're trying to end up with, you can't solve for it. And so really making sure what is the outcome you want, what a lot of us do is, and this is human nature, and it kind of gets us is if I, let's say you and I were just, you know, we were out at dinner and we were just talking and I would say, hey, what's going on? What, you know, what are things that are going on that you don't like? You could probably just launch and go. You could give me so many things that you just, you're not happy with, you don't like the way they're going. But if I said, well, what do you want? It would stop you, just like it would stop me. So I'm not saying I'm any better than anybody else. It's just a tendency that we have to really battle to shift from what I don't want to what I do want. Again, it's a, it sounds simplistic, but it is a huge shift. And then really it's all around asking a lot of questions of yourself, of other people, of checking if your assumptions are accurate. One of my favorite questions is I will, when I'm working with people, is I will ask them, 
What didn't I ask you that I didn't ask you, that I didn't know enough to ask? And usually that stops people and they kind of go, wow, that's a really great question. Oh, well, this would have been helpful. And so that is a fantastic question to put in your toolbox is to ask that question. And then really the next step is do something, you know, <laughs> take action. We've all been around people where you just swirl and you swirl and you swirl and you wait for the 100% solution with all the facts to be known. To your point earlier, the world is moving so fast. What may have been a fact at 10, 12 in the morning may not be a fact anymore by 10, 15. And so you really just have to go, okay, I'm here. I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to take action. I'm going to look and see what comes of my choices, right, of the decisions I've made, and then course correct if I need to. It's like an experiment, isn't it? You've got a good dose of curiosity. You're asking these questions. Mm -hmm. And then you're willing to take a chance and just try some of the solutions? Absolutely. And experimentation, and that, that's a beautiful word. I use it a lot myself with people. It's, it's a great word for a lot of reasons. When we think of experimentation, we expect, even on the scientific model, that we're going to learn something. But we don't always expect that what we're experimenting with or what we thought would happen is what's going to happen. And so it's that mindset that says, I am going to learn something. Not that everything's going to be exactly the way I want. And it was really, again, when I asked your folks, one of the things that causes them to get stuck, fear of failure, almost 40% of them, that was the number one reason that your folks said they kind of got stuck in problem solving. Ah, you've beat me to it. That was actually going to be my next question. I may as well ask it. What are some of the ways that people get stuck in problem solving? Based on what you've said, it sounds like fear is one of the big ones. Am I right? And that is number one. And it comes down to, you know, we all want to do things well. You know, we, we want to perform well. We want to be successful. Having that experimentation mindset helps you reframe what success is. Like, for example, with my, um, when I was a hospital president, I would be working with my team and I'm like, okay, let's try, you know, let's try and solve for that problem. Go, you know, play with something, come up with something you think will work. Let's test it. And somebody came back to me and I said, and it didn't work. And I said, yes, it did. Because now we know that that's not going to get us where we need to go. So we move on to the next thing. So we learn something. So it's a huge shift. So fear of failure was the number one. Following pretty close behind 32% of your folks, the number two reason was they just don't see options. A lot of that has to do with we are, and again, we talked about this with your folks. I mean, by training, if you are an accountant and you are, especially if you're a CPA doing taxes, you have one input and one acceptable output. You know, you don't have the latitude to be creative and be flexible. So when you have that mindset that says one right answer, you have to kind of come back and pull back from that, back to the earlier comment about examining your assumptions and really recognize, no, there is more than one answer. There just is. And so it's that jumping to this is the only answer, this is the only thing, being too quick off the draw to try and solve it really quick, which may not be helpful. Uh, and so it's, it's one of those pieces that really is not seeing the options. And the first thing really is to tell yourself, yes, there are more options. And when, when I presented to you, to your audience, one of the things I showed them was three very different pictures of an exact same type of flower that looked really, really different. And like I said to them at the time, I said, my reason for showing you this isn't to show you, hey, these are some photographs I took. It's just to show for you to really trigger how to think about what would be my default way to take an image of that flower. For most of us, it's straight down, looking down, up, you know, from height down, because that's how we see the world. It really takes a lot of effort to go, well, how many other ways can I take a picture of this thing? And that's the same way you want to approach your problems. You want to think, how many other ways can I approach this thing? We all have a default. And when your default has worked in the past, we are way more likely to just assume that that default is what we need to do. And as the world is changing so quickly, generally that same solution isn't going to work anymore. And it's really back to, again, slowing down to speed up you know, to go and look and say, okay, you know, let, let me look around my world here and see how many other ways that I could do this and look at this differently. I will say to people as a way to play with this in their own life, we all, I don't know that there's anybody that's going to listen to this that doesn't have a cell phone, but a cell phone has got a camera. I mean, that's just a pretty safe assumption. 
So an assignment people can do on their own is to take an object, and it does not matter what the object is, as long as it has some different sides and perspective, and challenge themselves with taking five different pictures of that one thing that look really different, right? So yes, you can look at it from the top, well, maybe you get down below it. Maybe you get on the same level of it. Maybe you change your positioning and you're shooting up at it, whatever it is, without moving it. How can you get really different images of this thing? It's a great way to kind of start to get your mind working around, wow, there is more than one way, you know, and my default is not the best. So the, the fear of failure was number one, where people get stuck. Not seeing options was number two. The next one that came in pretty close, we've talked about a little bit already, is trouble articulating what success looks like. Again, if you don't know what you're shooting for, you may hit it beautifully and it may be the most graceful, elegant solution ever, but if you don't know what success looks like, you're just gonna blow right past it. Or you're gonna swirl because of your fear of failure and not ever do anything, which is something a lot of us do too, right? We just kind of, well, I'm just waiting for one more piece of information, right? Or I'm waiting for, and then they wait indefinitely and they look up and they're like, oh, it's been a year and I haven't solved this problem. Hmm. You know, that, that drains a lot of us. The next one coming after, pretty closely after that, 26% of your folks said they don't ask questions. And that circles right back to the asking assumptions. You know, I mean, having assumptions. Because if you're assuming that you know everything you need to know, why would you bother to waste your time asking questions? So they really, they kind of feed off each other. So those were the top four. Another one that's a big deal that didn't come in quite as high, it came in at 19% was the tendency to drift toward conformity in groups. And when I asked your folks for problem solving, how many were working on issues by themselves versus part of a team? 68% of them said part of a team. So when you think about what we've talked about already and you think about making assumptions and being able to identify the outcome you want and taking action, if one individual human has trouble with that, when you add other people to the mix, that lack of clarity can be fatal to moving forward either at all or with a good solution. And so I really gave your folks credit that they recognize that they do tend to kind of drift toward conformity, whether it's power, right? If, my, if I'm sitting with my team and I say something, are they more likely to say, oh yeah, sure, whatever you say? Or do you have people that just aren't comfortable speaking up or it feels like it might be conflict if they have a different perspective? And so your leader's role here is to make sure that the culture you've created and the relationships you have all the time leads toward we value everyone's opinion and perspective, and we want to hear the dissenting voice. We must hear the dissenting voice. And so that's an ongoing action that your leaders can absolutely take that will serve them back as well with getting people more engaged. If people have a stake in it and are involved in it and helped create it, they will be way more engaged that if it comes down from on high, you will do this and you will like it. So it, it has a double layered benefit to it of approaching it that way. Yet we hear a lot about creating psychological safety and how important that is to fostering creativity and innovation. Here at the ARCPA, at ARCPA and SEMA, as we move into the new year 2020, we're talking a lot about how we have to reimagine ourselves as professionals, as companies, and as still very important, crucial elements in a fast-changing business environment. So from what you're saying, it sounds like that's quite important when it comes to complex problem solving as well. And transparency and openness, we know that's important. It's often a good thing to rock the boat in the right kind of way. I mean, because you're doing that because you want to solve problems, you want to inspire innovation. But the thing is, you need the right environment. You need to feel supported when you're doing so, which I think brings us back to your point that that psychological safety that you were talking about mm -hmm. is so important. So as I understand it, it, it's important because that helps you be the voice that might have a different but still very important and valid opinion. Absolutely, because everybody's perspective is valuable. And the fact that it's different is beautiful because it means that you see it differently. And it means that we will have a better, more complete picture as a starting place that will then allow us to come up with and create solutions that are really going to serve us all. Okay, so for leaders who want to foster this culture of problem solving and, and really support their teams, are there any pitfalls that these leaders should be mindful of? You know, I think in, in light of kind of this, this particular kind of conversation, I think coming back to what we've already seen in terms of people not being engaged, 
is that is a huge cultural question that will underpin everything you do and how it gets done and how engaged your folks are. And then, of course, spill over into problem solving. Giving people a sense, again, of there's nothing wrong, for example, with saying, let's say you and I are working together and, and you're the leader. There's not a thing wrong with you saying to me and the rest of the team, here's our outcome. Here's where we need to end up. Here are the three or four things that this solution needs to generate and create and make true. Now, I want all of you all to go off and with your varying perspectives, spend some time thinking over what, you know, where we are now, where we need to be, what are some options to get us there, and then I will make the ultimate decision. Not a thing wrong with that, as long as you're clear. All right. As long as you let everybody know ahead of time that they're going to be off working, but the ultimate decision rests with you. It's also equally viable to say, okay, I want y'all to come up with this. And then we as a group are going to make this decision as to how we're going to move forward. There's not a right or wrong. Again, it comes back to the clarity and having a relationship with your team that fosters that back to use your word, you know, about having people feel safe, having them be engaged and you need to live every day and all the time, you value different perspectives. You also need to recognize that hustling for a quick answer, an absent an emergency. I mean, there are certainly times when you need a quick answer. I mean, (laughs) I happen, like I said, I live outside of Fort Worth and our neighbor had a grass fire yesterday and we had three different fire departments respond and it could have been really, really, really bad. And so it's a lot of going, what do you need to respond to? What's your current environment? In that environment, I don't want somebody to be in charge. I don't want them to take the time to talk about this. I want them to say, this is what we're doing, do it now. So you have the recognition when it's okay and safe and a good idea to say, let's hand this off to the team versus when do I have to make the decision and I need to make it. You know, life would be a lot easier if we could say, here, follow rule one to 10, don't think, don't worry about context, and life will be awesome. (laughs) But that's not the world we live in anymore. So it's that judgment call first. Uh, But it's an ongoing project, really, um, to have people engaged and to be really clear as the leader as to what you're looking for and how you want people to work with you on it. Let's move out of the C-suite for a moment because we've talked about leaders uh, a little bit. So let's look at the individuals themselves. What are some things that I can do myself to foster my own ability to look at things differently and come up with those more unique solutions? Yeah, and that's a fantastic question because that's what we always want to get to, right? What can I do? What can I do differently as a result of this? And I know one of the things that was and is a huge issue for everyone is really all the noise in our life. And I had asked kind of some questions around what were the biggest areas of noise? Because we all know when we are feeling overwhelmed or we're tired or we're sick or there's just too many demands and too many deadlines, this is not a good time to be creative. It's just not. Just like we all know there are certain times to tackle certain projects. And if you're smart, certain times not to because you'll spend more time doing rework. And so really identifying what your noise is for you is a huge first step that you have to take. And I wish I could say you would take it once and be done. But again, with the pace of our life, that's not reality. You really need to make sure that you are checking your own bandwidth and making sure that you have what you need kind of from a mental capacity standpoint and a mental energy to tackle the problem you need to tackle. Because you may be wiser to either hand it to somebody else or let it sit for a little bit if it can, and then kind of take care of yourself and go, what do I need to do to create the mental space? And so when we talked about what some of the the things are that are noise that prevent that mental space and that ability to be creative, almost coming in as a tide where just this flat out daily, the pace of life, the constant influx of information or information overload and physical clutter at work or home. Those things all came in pretty much tied for the people that, you know, that we were chatting with that really are noise for them. And if you don't make the decision to manage that noise, you're always going to be suboptimal in what you're able to think about and decide just because you're just human. You have to be able to make that space for some people. Certainly been tons of research about, you know, meditation, whether it's just three or four or five minutes, just to clear your brain, whether it's getting up and going for a walk, One of the techniques that I have heard that I thought was just wonderful um, from Brendan Bouchard was 
It says, when you're working on a project, try and chunk it into, you know, no more than two hours. But every hour, get up and move. And in between projects, take a five-minute break to close mentally what you've just been working on. And then to go, okay, what do I need to get done with this next project and what do I need to achieve? So that you give yourself a mental space because most of us don't. We're like, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. And unfortunately, the more stressed we are and the more rushed we are, the less likely we are to take that step back. So that is a, that is a huge piece. And again, really taking the time and the discipline to go, what do I want? To identify the outcome that you're looking for. And for some of us, it's easier to rattle off what we don't want and then go, okay, that's what I don't want. Now is what I do want the opposite or is it something different? So there's nothing wrong with just kind of blurting out, writing down all the things you don't want, but don't stop there. You know, take that insight, take that information and go, okay. For example, I may not want to walk 20 miles today. Well, there is a whole host of options that are the opposite, quote unquote, of not walking 20 miles. But it could be I want a bike. It could be I want to walk 18 miles. It could be I want to run. You know, it could be I want to take a bus. I want to take a car. It's, so it's, it's really around, take, if, you, if your mind is hung up on your don'ts, really be intentional about what do you want. The other piece I talked about that did get me some looks when we were all together, and this is really apropos because we're talking the week of Thanksgiving, is be grateful for your problems. And I could feel the shift in the room and people were like, excuse me? But what my comment was, and I'm absolutely still 100% with this, if you have new problems to solve, then that means you've solved the old ones and that you're growing and you're developing. The bad place is when you're still like a gerbil on a wheel solving the same problem over and over and over again because that means you haven't addressed it. And so really it's an ad, a huge mind shift that says, if I've got new problems, this is awesome because it means I'm growing and I'm developing. And I say this to my clients all the time. And the first time I say it to them, they look at me like, excuse me, really? And then after a while, they're like, I get it now. <laughs> the fact that I've got new problems to solve means that I'm focusing on different things. And then back to your word that you used earlier as part of kind of the model that I use is really be willing to experiment, but also know where you can and you can't experiment. There are certain things, certainly in tax law, you can't experiment. Too, right? There are a lot of things you can do about how you get the work done. It's unfortunate that when we are overwhelmed, we don't see options. No, I'm the only one that can do it. No, it must be done this way. No, it must be done by now. There aren't as many hard and fast deadlines as we act like there are. Again, for your folks in tax season, that's not true. <laughs> now, still, you've got extensions and everything else. I get that, but that may not be somebody's choice. But we, we put so much pressure on ourselves by treating a deadline that may not even be real as a fact, and then we rush, and then we feel overwhelmed, and then we don't feel good about the decision we came up with. So, I mean, I would love to say that it's, it's all this kind of just magic fairy dust go by, you know, spend $29.99, buy this, sprinkle it on you, and life is good. It's really around the discipline of how you are going to think going forward and what you're going to allow in your life. I know it really resonated a lot when we talked about how do you say no? Quite a few people said, well, how do I say no? And I gave them so much credit because some were like, and it's both personal and work. We have this concept that we are this kind of split body somewhere, you know, it's like, but it's not. If you don't come in rested from home or you've got stuff going on at home or you're drained, that is absolutely going to spill over to your work. It just is. And so it's really around knowing what you need and how you need to do it. And I think the fact that, you know, about 30% of the people said clutter was a problem just says they're running so fast. They're not doing what they need to do to deal with that clutter to remove that pressure. So it just stays and it stays and it stays. And so being able to say no when someone asks you to do something is for a lot of people terrifying. And there are ways to say it that are like, no, how could you, you know, how dare you ask me that versus, you know, no, I am really sorry. It would be lovely if I could help you. But right now I don't have the bandwidth. And I know doing a really exceptional job is important. If somebody says, no, you must do this. Then a really awesome response is, okay, I get that that's a, that, you know, that's a new priority, that that's really shifted in importance. What do you want me to stop doing so I can give that the attention it deserves? I heard this on uh, another podcast recently, that when you say yes to one thing, you're in fact saying no to something else. That's quite a shift in 
mindset. We'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute or two as we continue our conversation with Recalibrate Cheryl Mobley. You're listening to the Go Beyond Disruption podcast. You can find out more about us and our work at gobeyonddisruption.com. Remember to uh, go through our archives. We've got almost 100 episodes. Uh, we bring them out every week and we look at the ways that technology is disrupting the way we work as well as the way that we as humans can respond innovatively and imaginatively using our intelligence uh, to turn the challenges into opportunities. You can find out more about that, as I said, at gobeyonddisruption.com. Look at the uh, archived episodes and, of course, uh, look at the show notes too. You'll see links to everything we've talked about there as well. We're talking to Cheryl Mobley about creative problem solving, and we were talking about the shift in mindsets, that when we say yes to one thing, we're in fact saying no to something else. And I think, Cheryl, that really makes us take a second look at what we want to say yes to, because no matter how much we might want to, we really can't say yes to everything. That is a beautiful reframe, and it's absolutely true, because you are either running your own life on your own priorities, or you are allowing other people to suck you into their priorities because we're all finite resources. Exactly. You make a choice for something, whether you think about it that way or not in the moment, you are making a choice not to do something else because you cannot do everything. Yeah. And and you clearly need that space, both the physical space and the mental space to effectively solve problems. Absolutely. That's it. And there's always some kind of busy work that I suppose we could be doing when instead we could be practicing our innovative thinking and our creative problem solving uh, muscles instead. I don't think I'm a particularly good problem solver because I tend to do the kind of the the guy thing, the the bloke thing. I jump straight to what I think the obvious practical solution might be instead of trying to be a bit more curious and maybe backing off a bit more before I come up with that kind of um, I can fix this response that I think a lot of chaps almost always default to. I think a lot of it, from what you're saying, is having that curiosity and then using that to give things more space and to take more time to step back a bit, to creatively find solutions from from a bit more of a a distance. Because we've we've all looked back and we've done something that made perfect sense at the time and we were like, what was I thinking? (laughs) And I don't know about you, but there have been days where I'm like, you know, I should file today. Filing is the limit of my mental value today. And then I shouldn't be solving things that are complex when I'm feeling like that. I just shouldn't. I need to own that and respect that and realize I'm not going to get a good outcome. I'm going to spend more time reworking this than if I just let it sit for a moment. Then there are other days where I'm like, get out of my way. I got this. This is so much fun. I mean, yes, let's go do this. And so it's, I have learned the hard way, unfortunately. That if I push past that, no, you shouldn't do that today, and I do it anyway, I'm going to spend more time doing rework and probably make my life a whole lot harder because I don't know about you, but unwinding something where I've really messed it up is a whole lot more work than if I just approach it cleanly and clearly the first time. Precisely, yeah. I actually think you've wrapped that up nicely. So let's go back to that phone camera I was talking about earlier, which I think makes us a great place to, to end. Uh, we'll do that with a challenge to our listeners. And that challenge is to grab their phones and go out to explore, to look at things from different angles, take photographs in unusual ways. I think that would be lovely. And if they ever get posted anywhere, I would love to see them because it's great to see what other people see. See things from different perspectives. And in that way, you could start exercising your creativity in new ways. And also have fun because problem solving doesn't always have to be a heavy thing. Oh, I absolutely agree handling things differently and learning from you and that you could kind of tease out what it is that you do differently. And it's, for me, it's a huge passion because we're, we are training curiosity out of all of us and it's, it's not going well. I mean, you look at people that have gone, whether they're engineers or it's nursing, whatever, and they do assessments pre and post education, they are losing critical thinking skills because, and you look at our general kind of lower level education, And we are teaching people to regurgitate. We're not teaching them to think. We're discouraging them from thinking because don't come to the teacher with an answer that's different than the right answer. And it's kind of a really slow process that teaches us, oh, there is only one right answer. And oh, it's that answer. And so it kind of squashes that creativity. So for me, a huge point of passion is how do we bring that back? 
which is why I like that, you know, kind of the, the phone exercise with your camera that I talked about, because just realizing there are other ways, if you choose to kind of get, uh, accept that wedge into the way you view the world, you can then kind of crack it open and go, well, what else can we do differently? What else are we not seeing? And it is that curiosity and that willingness to an experiment and the recognition that you are a human life form and you need mental capacity to be able to do these things and do them well. Well, Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate the time you've taken to share your perspectives on complex problem solving. You can see links to everything Cheryl's talked about. Simply go to our show notes, scroll through and click there. We can recommend going to aicpastore.com slash go beyond disruption or cgmastore.com slash go beyond disruption for more information on this. And you'll find lots of other free and sometimes paid for resources that can help you dig deeper into this topic in your own time. A big thank you to Cheryl. And of course, a thank you so much to our audience for listening to this podcast. We'll be back next week. Till then, I'm Kyle Hannon. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond Disruption, brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Learn more about today's topic at AICPA-CIMA.com forward slash disruption. This podcast is designed to provide illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. It is provided with the understanding that the association, its affiliates, and subsidiaries are not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional services. If such advice or expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional person should be sought. The association, its subsidiaries, and affiliates make no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to and assume no responsibility for the content or application of the material contained herein and expressly disclaim all liability for such damages arising out of the use of, reference to, or reliance on such material.